existing buildings, which have been replaced by modern shops. The exception is the parish church, off the picture to the left. And here are examples of estate houses built in the 1960s. Most of the newcomers into the village commute to Nottingham But there is one major employer, Brickley Geological the Smading Estate, a number of shops and other businesses, ranging from a funeral parlour to three supermarkets, two banks and a travel agent, most established during the period of rapid population growth. Not much has been built since the 1970s, because of Greenbelt restrictions. The quiz and the community. Such a rapid influx of people might have undermined the strong sense of community that had previously existed when Keyworth was small enough for most people to know each other, by sight at least. They had been to the same village school, now demolished passed much of their free time socialising, shopping and worshipping in the same village and those who commuted to work did so by bus where they met each other rather than by car. Today these local ties have loosened yet a sense of community has survived even grown in recent years. It is the purpose of this film to illustrate the cohesiveness of the community by focusing upon what has become a long-standing institution. Launched in 1976, the annual village quiz in which up to 30 local clubs, societies and businesses come together for a night during each of seven weeks between Christmas and Easter to pit their wits against each other in a spirit of friendly rivalry, watched by an audience which often tops a hundred. Here are two of the teams, with Quizmaster and his assistant, on the stage of the village hall, ready to start one of the rounds. The teams are Friends of Keyworth Primary and Nursery Schools and Keyworth Lawn Tennis Club. And here are shops of some of the other contesting groups. They include sporting clubs, probus, political parties, churches, schools, societies catering for special interests like drama, photography and dance, the Scouts, the National Women's Register, some local businesses like the British Geological Survey, Dead Ends, the Co-op Funeral Service and the Twinning Association Keyworth is twinned with Fainiers, a small town in northern France. The sheer range of interests and enthusiasms represented by these groups demonstrate the variety of tastes catered for. While there are many other groups who did not compete in 2000, like the Labour Party, who won several years running and dropped out recently, I wonder, was it to give others a chance? Or the guides and local history society, whose members were either too timid to enter a team or too busy doing other things? A flourishing community. What are the secrets of Keyworth's success? First, in keeping alive and fostering its community spirit, and second, and maintaining over a quarter of a century an annual village quiz which involves such a range of people and their interests. The answer to the first question includes
includes the following factors. What the new inherited from the old. The village of 1950 was already fairly large, as villages go, with over 1,200 inhabitants. It had a variety of flourishing groups, especially churches and sports clubs, which were always on the lookout for new members, and which welcomed people moving in. The newcomers were already entering a flourishing community. The kind of people who moved in. They included a high proportion of young families with the energy to get involved in social activities. Many had leadership qualities to get things started and to sustain them, and their interests ranged widely from sport to photography to literature. Here is the view of one quiz contestant. I think that's what makes a village tick, actually, is a lot of, uh, a lot of people with, who are community-minded, or enough people that are community-minded. It means that uh, events like the village quiz are, are very well supported. And uh, on the finals night, as you'll see, uh, you know, there's nowhere to sit. They're standing remotely, because people just come and uh, they're interested, they want to support their various teams that have been doing well. Yeah, it works. The size of the enlarged village was sufficient for viable groups to be formed for minority interests, like politics, as well as for many popular pastimes, like sport. The view of another contestant. Certainly it's a thriving community, there are a lot of groups. It's difficult now, if you start a new group, to find somewhere to meet. We know that from Keyworth Arts, because we have difficulty getting the village hall when we have a visiting play. It's booked up solid for one group or another. The fact that Keyworth is surrounded by many smaller villages has meant that its support base has been enlarged by some of their residents joining in too, like this member of both Keyworth Methodist Church and Ladies Probus. She's representing Probus in the quiz this year. I live at Bunny, but because there is only a church and a pub in Bunny. We don't even have a village store now. Um, I'm quite happy to come across to Keyworth, to the Methodist Church. Keyworth has remained a distinct entity, surrounded on all sides by open country, as illustrated by this aerial photograph taken in 1999, thereby preserving a sense of identity and belonging which might have been lost had it become part of an amorphous suburbia. That point and the way in which the quiz embodies the consequent community spirit is well made by the curate and member of the parish church team. Yeah, I mean, I guess it is. Um, I always think it's a very villagey village. There's lots of societies that people belong to. And the quiz, what part does the quiz play in, in, in this? I, th I think it kind of brings it all together and makes us aware of just what is going on in the village because you know, 28 organisations have managed to put forward teams this year. Um, I don't know how many communities could actually manage that. Even somewhere like Bridgeford or, or the Meadows or somewhere in the suburb of Nottingham, because it's not isolated from the rest of Nottingham, wouldn't perhaps have the same sense of lots of things all belonging in that one place that a large village or a small town like Keyworth could have. And, and the village quiz really encapsulates all that in, in a series of evenings. A flourishing quiz. As to the second question, the success of the quiz itself. Most of the answer lies in what has already been said. Its success reflects a lively community, but no institution like the quiz would succeed without competent and imaginative organisation. Keyworth has been fortunate to have had a succession of very able quizmasters and others willing to devote hundreds of hours each year, that is no exaggeration, to prepare the questions and plan the logistics involved in the smooth running of the event over seven weeks, in a form which both participants and audience enjoy. There have been five quizmasters over the past 24 years. Derek Oakley, Frank Hanforth, Michael Worth, Dick Francis, 
himself a BBC Mastermind semi-finalist. And the present incumbent, Stuart Bailey. Their main support, operating the microphones, buzzers and other electrical equipment over many years has been Chris Terrell Neal. That it is so enjoyable and brings together so many people with such diverse interest feeds back into and enhances the community spirit in the village. Here are comments from the current quizmaster, Stuart. So, how many questions have you asked so far then? I don't know about so far, but at the end of the, uh, end of the final it will be 1,512. Plus, um, that's calculated. I mean, I've asked a few spares because of, uh, I suppose there's probably been about 10 dead heats where you have to pull in a, um, a substitute question. So you could say probably no more than 1530 by the finish of the quiz. There was quite a lot of substitute questions, haven't there? Yeah, that, that's fine because I, I love substitute questions because both teams are very tense and bang straight away, dead heat, and it causes a ripple of amusement because, you know, obviously there's, uh, everybody's so keyed up and uh, Often, uh, in previous years, we've had because at the end of each stage, like at the end of round one, I calculate the percentage of questions asked correctly by the competitors, which is was 90 plus percent, which I thought was very, very good. It, which means that there's not many thrown out to the audience, and <coughs> they're about the right standard. They're consistently over the years been about 90%. If you talk about the percentage score rate over maximum, like if everybody got everything right first time and they answered all the Bell and Buzz's questions first time, and express the actual score over the maximum score, it's around the, about the 70 to 75%. And that is consistent. And if you go to the second round where you've got the, the brighter teams coming through, it stays the same, so it indicates that the level of the questions is keeping pace with the progress of the competition. So uh, I'm quite pleased with that. And now two members of the rugby club give their views on the quizmaster's role and how he discharges it. I think he does a pretty good job, all in all. There's a lot of questions. Absolutely, yeah. Tough job, it's like being a referee. Yeah. It's really hard, because you, you, you never please everybody. You're going you're to annoy four people, at least. <laughs> you know, whatever you do. <laughs> whatever you do. How the quiz runs. We conclude by describing and illustrating the form the quiz takes. It is a fairly standard pattern. Each team comprising four people, and each contest, which lasts about 20 minutes, is between two teams. In the preliminary rounds there are usually four contests e per evening session. Losers are knocked out and winners proceed to the next round and then to the next until there are four teams left for the semi-finals and then two for the final contest. Questions tend to get harder as the final is approached. The format of each contest has been standardized as follows. First, two rounds in which questions on common themes are addressed. In round one, to each team as a whole, and in round two, to individual team members. Then, a series again addressed to individuals in which they are given a limited choice of topic to be questioned on. And finally, the decisive bell and buzzer round where points go to whoever presses the bell or buzzer first and gives the correct answer. Reaction speeds matter as much as knowing the answer here. Questions are on a variety of subjects ranging from sport to pop music to history, geography, the arts and sciences and much more besides as the following examples illustrate. First, a clip from the opening round between the Rotary Club and the Methodist Church. First round, three points, two points for referral. And 
we start with the Methodists this round. One or two questions about affairs or scandals which have hit the headlines recently or not so recently. Okay, your question, Methodists. In 1983, Parkinson left the government to spend more time with his family after revelations concerning his former secretary. What was her name? Sarah Keyes. Sarah Keyes. Obviously, Rosary Club. Rosary Club. A former Labour government minister disappeared in 1974 and turned up in Australia in the company of his secretary. What was her name? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Is it the secretary or the... The secretary. A former Labour government minister disappeared in 1974 and turned up in Australia in the company of his secretary. What was her name? We don't know. We don't know anybody from Methodists. No, sorry, no. Anybody? Sheila Buckley. Oh, yeah. Sheila Buckley, yes, Sheila Buckley. Okay. Your question to Jane Methodist. With which member of the royal family was the name of Lily Langtree romantically linked in the late 19th century? The Prince of Wales. Prince of Wales, yes, the future member of the seventh, the yeah, three points there. And your question, Rotary, what was the name of the beautiful wife of the Greek King Menelaus who ran off with a Trojan prince sometime in the 13th century BC? Helen of Troy. Helen of Troy. Okay. Methodists. Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky, you wouldn't have those, would you now? Became household names on account of the apparent goings on in the White House. But what was the name of the person who secretly taped their telephone conversation? Second, from the contest between the Table Tennis Club and Crossdale School, registering some doubt about whether the quiz master has made a slip or played a trick on the two teams and the audience. How many animals of each type did Moses take into the ark? Moses. <laughs> it's a trick question, none, right? Oh. <laughs> Which, Which is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd said no, I'd have known it was two. Which headline appeared in The Sun on the 4th of May 1982 about the story of the sinking of the Argentine ship Richard? Gotcha. Gotcha. Two points across that. What would you do with an LRP, do with an LRP which was introduced to petrol filling stations recently? Cross that. Put it in your car. Put it in your car, let replacement petrol, yes. In the old advertisement, we were urged not to say brown. Third, in the contest between the Bowls Club and Four Feathers, a team of badminton players, with the announcement of scores at the end of round one, followed by some questions in round two. And the end of that round, please. <laughs> Bowls have six points and Four Feathers have eleven. Okay, some acronyms and abbreviations, uh, right, this is an individual round and we start I believe with four feathers in the form of Roger, uh, we're all familiar with these types of questions, all I want you to tell me, what do the initials TCCB stand for? Two points, two points. Gerald, you yes. missed, U-M-I-S-T. <laughs> the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. Spot on, yes, two points there, two points there for the Bowls Club, Robin. 
In the First World War, an army chaplain named Tommy Clayton started a club for the troops called Toc H of Popperinga in Belgium. How is the name Toc H derived? comes from the telegraph, the T for top, they say T, top H is Talbot House. Yes, one point there. Uh, we With um, Alma? Alma. In the shipping world, what do the initials VLCC stand for? Not very large no. cargo to contain it. <laughs> v, v, v for Victor, B L C C. No? no. Audience? Very large crude carrier. Very large crude carrier. It's an oil tanker, yes, it's an oil tanker. Okay, and your question, John. In the years of the Second World War, how did the acronym Pluto come about? Uh, pipeline under the ocean. Yes, pipeline under the ocean to serve the Normandy beaches. And lastly, part of the bell and buzzer round during the final between the rugby club and BGS. British Geological Survey, in which the questions are much stiffer than those of the earlier rounds. According to Shakespeare, whose last words were, the rest is silence? Rugby? King Lear. Not King Lear. Do we know BGS? Hamlet. Hamlet. One point. No penalty. In the names of places, what do the prefix Abba in... Rugby. The mouth of a river. Correct, for two points. What relation were Edward IV and Richard III? Rugby. Um, they were brothers. They were indeed the brothers. In church architecture, what name is given to the screen tapestry or Rugby. The, uh, uh, triptych. Not a triptych. That's two points away for rugby and a chance for one point with BGS. Uh, root and root screen. You could have had the whole question. Um, a screen tapestry or the light which is placed behind the altar? No? Audience? Viridos. Nobody gets any points there. In which war did the so called Battle of the Nations take place? Rugby. The Napoleonic War. Yes, it was the final defeat of Napoleon before his exile to Elba. Two points to rugby. In geographical term, what is magnetic declination? BGS. It's the deviation of uh, magnetic north from true north. Yes, indeed. If you looked at Medusa, you return to... Stone and Gorgon. Any more? Um, um, you would turn to stone by Medusa. Anyway, I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I was going to say, how did Perseus manage to kill him? And yet, the boy looked in the mirror. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, he had a shield. Yes, yeah, very interesting, but it was a dead heat anyway. Yes, he looked in the mirror in his shield. That's a substitute question. Who did Lady Caroline Lamb describe as mad? Lord Byron. Rugby club get two points. Your last question. And both teams get a shot at this, and the one closest to the correct answer gets two points. The spirit in which the quiz is entered varies from team to team and between individuals. Most take part for the fun of it. It's just, it's just a fun, you know, you know, it's not... The aim is not to win, it's more to take part and enjoy yourselves. 
it really is about the Olympic uh, idea of participating and having a bit of fun. Some are relieved to be knocked out in the first round, but others take it more seriously. Because some teams say they just enter it for a laugh, and they say, well, there are a few teams that take it very seriously. Now we want to win. A keen competitive edge becomes apparent among teams that survive the initial rounds. And, uh, yeah, some people tend to get very, 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 very involved and carried away. Some people take it too seriously. Which is also reflected among their audience backers, who sometimes get carried away by their enthusiasm. The, the audience uh, are like quiz groupies who, who go yeah. every week and they love answering questions and they can't resist. If there's a, if there's a question they know the answer to, some of them can't resist um, saying the answer and sometimes that this is quite loud and you, know, you hear from the stage and then you've got a moral dilemma. If you, if you don't know the answer, do, do I follow what uh, this person said or, or do I sort of confess that I heard the answer? So what do you do? The, well, one of the I always, I always confess, I would, we, we, we would never cheat. But, um, one of the prerequisites yeah. <laughs> of being on the team is to have good hearing, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, some, some of the audience get really carried away. They get really involved with it, and uh, they have to be told off uh, quite often. Has that ever caused any kind of you know, eruptions? I think so, because I think uh, there are some people who have accepted an answer from the audience, and, <laughs> and then the opposition have sort of felt this was a bit unfair. So, yeah, there have, been, there have been moments. I don't think blood has been spelt, but uh, harsh words have been said. <laughs> the 2000 final between the Rugby Club and the British Geological Survey is rounded off by the last question of the final, and therefore of the whole quiz for the year. Your last question, and both teams get a shot at this, and the one closest to the correct answer gets two points. In this quiz, Tonight, this year, how many questions have been asked in Quiz 2000 since the start on February the 7th? Hmm. Any shots? Roby? For, BG, uh, for rugby, for BGS, 1200. 1200. BGS get it for 1200. 1512. The final result is announced. And at the end of this exciting contest, ladies, can I have the score, please? This is followed by the presentation of awards by the Chair of the Parish Council, Daphne Butler. The Derek Oakley Cup to the winning team, a shield to the runners-up, and a small trophy replica to each member of both teams. Well, once again, 24 years and the quiz is still going. It was a wonderful idea when it was first thought of, and I'm so pleased that it's still going. So you will be back for the Silver Jubilee next year, <coughs> won't you? Um, terrific final. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to all the organisers. Bill has really thanked everybody anyway. <laughs> greatest pleasure. And you are seeing this to well, the yes. <laughs>
the formal proceedings over for another year, participants retire to the bar for a friendly tipple, after which the quizmaster goes home to begin putting together another 1,500 questions for next year. <laughs>